Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, my name is Lauren Regan. I'm the executive director and attorney with the Civil Liberties Defense Center out of Eugene. Um, for about 10 years now, we've been doing activist defense, primarily um, ra radical activists or marginalized communities. We represent protesters around the country during um, mass actions, as well as uh, suing police and government officials for unlawful spying and police misconduct. Uh, so. <laughs> About a week ago, we just won a big federal trial in Eugene on behalf of a cop watcher who had his camera illegally seized while videotaping police, uh, and then uh, the police searched his camera and beat the crap out of him, and the federal courts just ruled that uh, not only was it a false arrest, but it was also an unlawful search and seizure, as well as the police using excessive force against him and it set the law in Oregon for the rights of cop watchers to videotape police in public. So, <laughs> so that was fun. Um, and tomorrow from 1 to 3 we're giving a Know Your Rights training and we'll go into the details of what the law uh, is at this point in Oregon for videotaping the police. Um, but tonight I'm going to talk to you about the American Legislative Exchange Council, or ALEC. Uh, probably most of you are here because of the F-29 actions that are about to happen around the country. Um, CLDC has been working on ALEC probably since about 2006. Um, my personal involvement with it uh, came from fighting against a law, an ALEC bill, um, that was passed through Congress called the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act. The AETA basically made it a federal crime of terrorism to hinder the profits of an animal enterprise. So interfering with a fur farm, a zoo, animal experimentation, anything that made profit off of animals in any shape or form, if you hindered the profits of that enterprise and used interstate commerce, i.e. the internet, in order to affect that interference, you are now a federal terrorist if the U.S. Attorney's Office seeks to shine the light on you. So when that law was pending, I started looking into it and discovered this group called ALEC. Um, and ALEC started actually in the mid-1970s. It's been around for a while. It's a nonprofit organization, believe it or not, uh, and it's basically made up of some of the world's most uh, largest and wealthiest multinational corporations. Um, and part of the reason why ALEC has become popular or more known in the last couple of years is because the Center for Media and Democracy uh, had some documents handed off to them by a whistleblower, an ex, a disgruntled ex alec member, gave them a shit ton of documents uh, that told us the ways of this secret organization um, that heretofore we'd kind of, you know, been able to sort of figure a few things out, but we've never had the level of detail um, as was disclosed by this whistleblower. And what we found was that the model bills, and for those of you that aren't familiar with that term, uh, this organization, this nonprofit, is made up of legislators and corporate bigwigs and lobbyists. And they sit at a table and they draft bills that then they literally sell to legislators in state and federal legislatures. So that these elected representatives will go back to their halls of Congress or their state legislatures and push Alec's agenda across the country. And so when I use the term model bill, that's what I'm talking about. They literally draft legislation to hand off to our legislators, who are supposed to be doing this work, uh, and that's why we've got some of the crazy laws that we've got going on right now. Um, these model bills were basically wish lists for corporations, um, and they basically, uh, the entity, the ALEC entity, they vote on these agendas behind closed doors in these secret national meetings, and they have task forces that are set up to propose these radical uh, pieces of legislation that rewrite 
almost all of our rights in this country, in almost every area of law. Um, so, part of why this was such an important project is it's really important for the American people to see these bills, you know, to be able to analyze them and to see what's been happening in their own state legislatures. Um, and to be able to track these bills back to ALEC and its task forces, um, which is not necessarily an easy thing to do. So, um, on ALEC's website, ALEC.org is their website, um, you will see that ALEC touts to its members that corporations have a, quote, voice and a vote. They have a voice and a vote through ALEC task forces on our lives, on bills before, in many instances, even before they are introduced um, in legislatures across the country. So ALEC is funded by some of the wealthiest corporations in the world. Uh, corporations like Koch Industries, um, which are billionaires uh, David and Charles Koch, uh, who run that company. Exxon is probably the wealthiest of all wealthy uh, corporations on the planet. Okay. Um, Alec, okay, so this is a little graph. This is out of a great uh, report that was put together by Common Cause. Um, our website is cldc.org, and on it we have several Alec pages. And a lot of the reports and things that I'm referencing tonight, you can actually pull them down for yourself if you're interested in reading the whole thing. But this um, is basically showing you in millions of dollars where ALEC corporations, uh, where their money goes. And just so you know, um, you know, Reynolds American is a tobacco company, in case you didn't know that. Uh, Pharma is a pharmaceutical trade lobby organization. Uh, people probably know the list of these other ones. Uh, Altria is also a tobacco company combined with macaroni and cheese. All-American. Philip Morris, it's the former Philip Morris. Yeah, right. Um, so ALEC currently has about 2,000 state legislators and corporate executives that are currently members of this nonprofit organization. And in general, what they've been focusing on over the last few years is legislation that affects voting rights, environmental protections, health care reform, uh, labor and public workers' rights, over 180 bills are enacted, 180 ALEC bills are enacted in every state of the country every single year. So, 826 bills are introduced in the states roughly, and about 180 were passed. So, ALEC, in their 2001 Leaders in the States report, said, since 1973, the citizen legislators of the American Legislative Exchange Council... <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. Our dog. Sorry. Uh, anyway, Alex says that they have advanced a common-sense conservative agenda based on the fundamental principles of free markets, limited government, federalism, and indivi individual li liberty. Today, with 2,400 members, ALEC is the largest bipartisan individual membership association of state legislators in the nation. Um, they also go on to say the senior leadership positions uh, include hundreds of other ALEC members, are chairman of ranking members of committees and caucuses, or hold other significant and influential positions. Legislators also contribute to advancing the ALEC agenda by serving on ALEC's board of directors or state or task force chairs. So to give you a couple examples, in 2011, this past year, ALEC had major victories in Wisconsin and Ohio, um, particularly regarding restricting um, bargaining power of public workers unions. $304,000 were given to Wisconsin's governor, Scott Walker, more than $536,000 on Ohio's Governor John Kasich. Both are proud to claim that they are ALEC alum. Uh, legislators in seven states, including Oregon, last year drew on a proposal drafted by ALEC to advance legislation withdrawing our state from a regional agreement at fighting global warming. And interestingly, out of all 51 states and territories that are ALEC members, 
Oregon receives the third largest amount of ALEC money in the whole country. The only two states that get more money than Oregon are Tex no, are Arizona, with anti-immigration laws, basically, and California. We are third in line, which I was shocked to learn. So, um, ALEC was not only responsible for that anti-environmental bill um, that we passed, um, but they're also responsible for a bunch of tough voter ID laws. These have been passed in 18 different states. They actually restrict the rights of college students to vote, thousands, hundreds of thousands of college students, as well as people who don't have driver's licenses, which includes senior citizens and people that just don't drive. Um, in the wake of the U.S. Supreme Court's decisions that allow corporations to give uh, politicians as much money as they want, ALEC has pushed states to reject bills that would require these corporations to get shareholder approval for their political contributions. And so not only do they draft model legislation, but they fight against stuff that they think is against their corporate interests. So speaking of contributions, uh, Alex corporate fat cats have invested more than $370 million in state elections in the last year. Uh, they have um, financed not only corporate campaigns um, for and against ballot measures, but they also pour money into particular politicians' campaigns. So especially in years like this, as we're leading up to an election, some of these um, legislators, 14 of them in Oregon alone, including Governor Kitzhaber in the past, uh, are just falling all over themselves to snatch up these corporate profits. And um, there's a report on our website that literally lists out every Oregon legislator that takes money from ALEC and ALEC corporations. So you can see exactly who is getting money from who. Um, <clears throat> so to give you some comparison of ALEC money, um, oh, and actually. So this. This is Oregon right here, just so you can see it. But um, so, just to give you some comparison, Washington, our neighbor to the north, gets 6.5 million dollars in ALEC money. Montana, 166 thousand dollars, not even a million. Idaho got 364 thousand, and Oregon at 16.2 million dollars in ALEC money. But California, the largest in the country. $240 million spent in California in one year. So um, there are 22 major corporations that basically make the bulk of ALEC donations. They're called the Private Enterprise Board. And they spent $38 million on state politics in one election cycle alone. And um, so here's some examples of the types of model bills that have been passed in the last year through ALEC. Um, one of the most disturbing, they are um, passing development of privately owned prisons. There is the Corp Corrections Corporation of America, is a key player. They actually drafted the Arizona anti-immigration laws that were struck down. Uh, the CCA builds or runs prisons in 21 states. They reported 2010 revenues of $1.7 billion dollars, and they have identified immigration detention as an emerging market for the prison industry. So that's where their money is going right now. Uh, they have been supporting bills for public subsidies for private schools. Like I mentioned, restrictions of voting rights for college students and people that don't have driver's licenses. They, have, they support unlimited secret corporate spending on behalf of political candidates and parties. And they've worked on behalf of oil companies to undermine climate change proponents. The pharmaceutical manufacturers, um, those are who pushed the AETA that I mentioned earlier. Um, but the pharmaceutical manufacturers have been passing bills um, to the various states um, that they should be banned from being able to import prescription drugs from mm -hmm. other places. Mm -hmm. uh, they consist of Bayer, Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, GlaxoSmithKline, and Pharma that I mentioned, which is the Drug Industries Trade Association. They invested $134.2 million in state campaigns, and more than half of that was from Pharma alone, as you saw from that prior 
um, prior thing. And as I mentioned, those pharmaceutical giants are not only making you know, our drugs uh, inordinately expensive, but um, they're passing anti-animal rights laws in every state and federal Congress uh, that basically exists. They've also been working with telecom firms to block local authorities from offering cheap or free municipally owned broadband. God forbid we have that. Um, they've been fighting against insurance companies to prevent state insurance commissioners from requiring insurers to meet strengthened accounting and auditing rules. Um, big banks like Bank of America, etc. Uh, actually, they passed a, well, they have recommended a bill that seniors be forced to give up their homes via reverse mortgages in order to receive Medicaid. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> making friends all over the place. Uh, the asbestos industry worked with Alec to try to shut the courthouse door on uh, Americans suffering from mesothelioma um, and other asbestos-related diseases. And finally, we all remember Enron. Uh, Alec was behind the deregulation of the utility industries, which then eventually caused the U.S. to lose what the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission estimated as $5 trillion in market value. So, what they oppose are things like federal and state environmental regulations, uh, the new federal health care reform, uh, they, they have their own version that they're trying to pass called the Freedom of Health Care Act. <laughs> they have introduced it in 44 states and it has already passed in 18, basically negating the Obama's health care plan. Uh, Alec invested $15.1 million last year um, just in health care reform, anti-health care reform. Um, they have been fighting state by state to do away with state minimum wage laws. Uh, and of course they've been attacking trade and public employee unions. And then finally, my final example, um, Altria, um, which was Philip Morris, and Reynolds American, the two uh, largest tobacco companies in the U.S., they're both on Alex's private board, and they have been fighting state regulations against secondhand smoke, increased state taxes on tobacco, uh, fighting FDA regulation of tobacco, and in 2006 alone, we found a statistic where um, the company spent $35.3 million in a successful campaign to stop a California ballot initiative that would have directed revenue from tobacco taxes to improve hospital care for children, as well as to bolster anti-smoking campaigns. Um, all of this model legislation is basically pushed by a lobbying law firm uh, called Shook, Hardy, and Bacon. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, they have very strong ties to the tobacco and pharmaceutical industries, and um, they've long used Alex's abilities to get a wide swath of state laws enacted to further the interests of its corporate clients. Um, so, there are over 800 model bills um, that you can look at right now. Um, if you go to the Center for Media and Democracy, you can actually see all of these um, bills as they're coming up um, and what state they're from. They've actually done a great job of tracking it. Um, one of the things that a lot of nonprofits are calling on people to do, with, you know, so. Alec is technically a nonprofit, you know, just like my little organization, or you know, just like all sorts of small nonprofits. They don't have to pay certain taxes because of their status. But the IRS has these really strict rules for us that say we can't lobby. You know, we can't go and get legislators to pass laws for us. That's called lobbying, and that's not allowed under the IRS, or IRS rules for nonprofits. Yet. That's exactly what Alec does every single day. And so there's been a call for people to write to the IRS and demand that Alec be investigated for violating the IRS regulations on um, their tax exempt status. Just a little way to mess with them a little bit. Now, in Oregon, like I mentioned, there are 14 politicians currently on the Alec dole. Um, some of you may know, a few weeks ago, there was a Senate bill introduced, Senate Bill 1534. It literally made it a crime, it made it a felony. If you use Twitter, Facecrack, 
social networking, and you have two or more people that you solicit to commit a crime, any crime. So if I text you and say, by um, Representative Wisnant, who is out of Sweet Home, um, and luckily for us, two days ago, the bill was killed in the hearing. So it's no longer alive. Um, yay. But literally, the, the bill said, uh, if you use electronic communication to solicit two or more persons to commit a specific crime at a specific time and location, <laughs> you have committed a felony under, under state law. Uh, so that included everything from sit-ins to, you know, you name it. Um, two other ALEC bills that have been introduced in our Oregon legislature. House Bill 3484 was called Council on Efficient Government. It was introduced by Representatives Conger, Wisnant, Telfer, Brewer, Esquivel, and several others. Um, it mirrored an ALEC bill called Council on Efficient Government Act. And literally, um, this law would have caused um, our state legislator to review whether goods or services provided by state agencies should be privatized. And that included prisons. So, um, right now, it's still in committee. No votes have happened on it yet, but it's still in a live bill. What's the House Bill 3484, Council on Efficient Government. Um, and then House Bill 2672 uh, was passed about a year, well, not passed, it was uh, introduced a year ago relating to the distribution of tobacco products. Um, it basically was the exact same as Alex's resolution on taxation of moist, smokeless tobacco. Uh, and basically, you know, what's going on there is um, they are, the tobacco companies are kind of bidding against each other on you know, chewing tobacco versus the kind of cigarettes that you smoke. Um, they're kind of trying to find new ways to profit um, and they don't want taxes on chewing tobacco because then people are going to buy less of it, so they're basically trying to fight against the taxes. Um, so as I mentioned, probably the four largest um, government politicians that have received the most money that we could track down data on, because I should mention, um, ALEC doesn't disclose what legislators are on their dole, and most legislators aren't too keen in announcing to the public that they are on a corporate dole. Um, and so on our website, we have some template letters where you can write to your elected representative as an Oregon public records request and demand to know whether or not they are receiving ALEC money, and if so, from who and how much. Um, so that's one way to find out if your elected rep is on the dole. But uh, John Kitzaber, Kurt Schrader, Robert Shoemaker, and Jean Wisnant, Wisnant uh, are the four largest benefactors of multinational corporate donations. Um, and if you want to um, see more detail on who exactly is getting how much, um, check out ProPublica's website, uh, ProPublica, all one word, dot org. They have some great ALEC resources there, including all of the campaign contributions. Um, so the next national ALEC meeting is May 11th, 2012 in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, this past year, in 2011, they held their national meeting in New Orleans, and it was the first of their national meeting to have thousands of protesters outside, and they actually finally got a little taste of what it might be like if uh, we all woke up and realized they should be our central enemy. Um, because, you know, no matter what cause you work on, you know, whether it's anti-war or environmental or animal rights or, um, you know, Occupy Portland, all of us uh, have um, Alec to thank for a lot of the work that we're doing. Um, and they are constantly throwing, you know, additional crimes to try and basically deter activists from going after them. So uh, ALEC is a great target, especially for Occupy. You know, it kind of fits very neatly into corporate greed and uh, you know, the disparity of wealth and income. And of course, just the idea of purchasing democracy. Um, you know, especially in the face of Citizen United, the idea that corporations can buy politicians, can buy laws, uh, can basically outspend us 
in attempting democracy in this country is pretty outrageous. Um, so, the next part of this meeting tonight is for you guys to strategize on what you're going to do. Um, you know, I, like I mentioned, I'm active with Occupy Eugene and we're working on the same, same things, trying to find targets. Um, you know, personally, I think Exxon, as one of the largest and wealthiest corporations in the United States and one of the ones that has uh, heavily spent uh, in this state and many others, uh, there's practically an Exxon on every corner, so there should be plenty of targets out there. Um, the real question is, how do you put a dent you know, in their bottom line? You know, how do you organize uh, corporate boycotts, or how do you make them feel it where it really counts for them, which of course is their profit margin? Um, and so, uh, with that, um, I'm happy to take any questions you have, but that's you know, basically the material I was going to cover. Yeah. Aren't uh, non organizations considered corporations? Well, they're technically it's called a non-profit corporation, but the difference is that they're a corporation, a pure corporation, by law is required to make profit its paramount objective. Nonprofits are not allowed to make profit, so there's a big distinction there. But there's a lot of uh, nonprofits that do profit a lot. Are there not? Well, they're not technically allowed to create profit. If you're talking about big, big nonprofits that bring in a lot of money and have a lot of staff and spend a lot of money, that may be true. But at the end of the day, they have to show a zero balance at the end of the year. They're only allowed to bring in as much as they spend on program work, technically. Well, as opposed to shareholders, which is really the issue. Yeah. With the sign up there shut down the corporations, uh, Maybe you should say, except nonprofits. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't know that most people think of nonprofits as mainstream corporations. But. Some people will definitely semantically put that in terms um, if they uh, don't visit some of their Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Why are they working only at the state level, or are they at the federal level? They are at the federal level. The Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act that I mentioned was a federal, is a federal law. Um, and definitely in terms of EPA regulations, uh, labor laws, you know, there are a lot of attacks that they've been making at the federal level, but they have been much more effective in uh, state levels. And I think looking at our own legislature is kind of an example. Generally, they're a little less experienced politicians, understaffed, they're much more willing to have someone hand them off an already written up thing and literally just pass it off to committee. Uh, so state legislators seem to be much more malleable and easy for them to push agenda through faster than the federal level. Um, do you know anything about their participation in education bills? You mentioned like what, funding private schools and things like that. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more. Well, in general, they're big proponents of privatizing everything, and that includes public education, including public universities. You know, I think the University of Oregon is kind of a pretty good example with Phil Knight and Nike's money, you know, literally pushing to make the U of O a private institution in the next 10 years. So um, I do think that there are ALEC affiliates and ALEC um, members that are pushing it across the educational spectrum, um, but they definitely seem to be focused more on um, really gutting public schools at this point. Yeah. So, what are the sources we currently use to connect Alec with bills, and um, like, is it mainly through the leaks of ex-employees, or is it through information requests? Well, so right now, um, Common Cause and the Center for Media and Democracy have been doing a good job of um, looking at campaign finance reporting, um, looking at corporate um, tax returns. You know, taking different pieces of information from different places and actually putting to them together in tables. Um, which thank God they're doing it, not us, not me anyway. Um, but Common Cause um, has that information up there. Um, who's the other one? Center for Media and Democracy also has a version of it up there. Um, ProPublica has um, the state by state contributions. Um, with the corporate dollars behind they don't publish anything, right? So, Alec? Yeah. No. Um, and you know, it's interesting, if you go to their website, you can maybe look at the first page. 
um, but you're not, you know, there's nothing beyond that you're, that you're allowed. I mean, up until like in the last year, they were a top secret entity. They were really shadowy. We could hardly, you know, the only information we could get out of them was from every nonprofit has to file what's called a 990, where you have to list your big donors. So for years, we've been able to find out how much money annually they're bringing in. And I actually forgot to mention, you know, right now their budget is $7 million. Uh, for a legislator to become a member of ALEC, they pay between $50 and $100 a year. So that's about $100,000 that comes from their uh, elected representative members. The rest of that money is direct <laughs> donations from those corporations. Yeah? Um, with corporate personhood, is ALEC going to kind of be phased out as a middleman? It seems like previous this was the way for corporations to make money go where they wanted. Now can they just directly do the job that Alex was doing? Well, I think that they all like the idea of a round table think tank to come up with this model legislation. And they have these law firms and lobbyists that literally not only write the bills, but then push them and track them through the various houses. I don't think that they will get rid of that system that has been working so well for them. Do you know whether President Governor Hitzhaber has, has been given any ALEC money since 2008? I believe so. Um, let's see, I actually brought that with me if you want to hold on a second. Or in 2008. Um, let's see. Later, sorry. Oh, it's okay. Um, so if you go on ProPublica's website, um, they have it broken down by state. I know Kitsava is listed, uh, and I think he's in like the top rung of donations. And it will actually list what corporations donated how much. Was there another question? I wanted to add, uh, you mentioned Common Cause. Uh, actually, Common Cause is the initiator of the, of the uh, inquiry into putting the pressure on Alec to have on the government to to uh, investigate the nonprofit legitimacy mm -hmm. of Alec. Uh -huh. So yep. Tom Cutler be pushing that hard work. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I'll come back to you. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, I was really surprised here that Oregon is the third highest receiver of Alec. Mm -hmm. You have to be a why they focus so much attention on Oregon? I mean, it's really bizarre. I mean, a lot of the monies seem to be um, natural resource related, uh, extractive industries, a lot of pharmaceutical money, um, a lot of healthcare reform money, um, you know, anti, you know, anti gay marriage, you know, social cause types of funding. Um, but yeah, it was really, really surprising to me too. Um, but they, I think they see California and Oregon as sort of bellwether states, maybe. But I really don't know. I was just as surprised to find out. So in Oregon, has been a laboratory for the private enterprise experiment, you know, the Klamath Basin agricultural things going on there, and water fights, mm -hmm. yeah, where Cheney was involved, and Dale Morton and Interior. So uh, Oregon has a real history of the, of the right trying to get in and privatize. <coughs> and, and, and the National Forest, hardball, where, where uh, in Clam Falls when I was there, the mayor, who happened to be the, uh, the, the, uh, the head of the Forest Service uh, the, of the National Forest in Clam Falls, uh, was also uh, the one who made the decision to cut all the trees. Mm -hmm. So it's all blended in, and so that's probably why. Yeah. yeah. Well, a few years ago, we challenged an Oregon law uh, called interfering with agricultural operations. Uh, it was passed by the timber and ranching industries in Oregon. And uh, we challenged the constitutionality of that law and actually won. And now the law has been taken off the books. But when we were researching that law and how it got passed, 
it was really shocking to me. I actually had to listen to the audio tapes of these committee hearings in the Oregon legislature. And it was frightening to see people who didn't even know how to spell the word law drafting legislation that we were then going to be bound to until some lawyer challenged it. I mean, literally, it was um, you know making outrageous statements like this particular law made it a crime if you interfered with an agricultural operation. You hindered or interfered with one. And it was ranchers and stuff saying things like, we got to find a way to stop those earth firsters. You know, like blatantly in the record, you know, specifically referencing particular groups and particular causes. Uh, you, know, you, we, you know, we argued to the court if you just change the word, you know, environmentalist to some racial minority or some other word, it would have been patently unconstitutional. But, um, and that was, you know, that was an ALEC affiliate bill, which basically means that the um, ranching and industry and some of the large timber barons in the Northwest uh, also donate money to ALEC in exchange for them assisting in passing laws like the Oregon State Forest Practices Act, which is the bane of many of our uh, suffering in, in Oregon in terms of environmental protection laws. So, Do you know, um, off the top of your head, any law firms in Portland, uh, maybe located in the downtown area, that handle a large load of uh, ALEC traffic? You know, I don't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they're not normally my allies, so. Um, but I'm sure a little Google search could help you out with that. Uh, do you know if Facebook has anything to do with Alec? Um. I don't. I mean, I know that they just went public. Um, they're opening that place in Hillsborough as well, right. I think, right? Yeah. No, I never. I haven't read anything or seen anything specifically mentioning that. I think that um, because. Facecraft was owned by that single owner until recently. I'm not sure that he, I mean, he's certainly not listed as an ALEC donor or supporter yet. So, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Um, why haven't laws like the Animal Terrorism Act and maybe some of the things involving privatization of prisons been challenged? Um, I actually represented the first group of animal rights activists that got prosecuted under the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act in California. Uh, they were picketing a, an animal, animal researcher's home on the public sidewalk, just holding signs and chanting on a public sidewalk, which is constitutionally protected. Um, and they got prosecuted as terrorists. And we challenged the law on its constitutional grounds, and the judge ruled in our favor and dismissed the criminal case. Um, but the government chose not to appeal, so that law is not enforceable in California at this point, and generally would not be likely to be enforced in the Ninth Circuit, meaning in our region of the country. But because they didn't appeal, the litigation ended there, and the law is that the eradication of that law is only binding on that area of courts. And since then, um, there have been uh, a couple other prosecutions under the AETA. Um, some kids in Utah uh, got arrested for releasing mink, and they took a plea deal. Um, they were facing, you know, 20 years in prison. They were offered two. They chose to take that rather than challenging it. And so they were the first people convicted of it. Um, there are still plans in the works to civilly challenge it based on its constitutionality. We were just kind of hoping the criminal road is faster than the civil road, so we were hoping to just have have it go up the criminal path and uh, get it bounced off the books, and that didn't happen. So uh, it's it's in in the works. And then in terms of the private prison industry, there you know there have been people that have been challenging. Um, the functioning and running of these private prisons um, on a case-by-case -case individual basis, but as far as I know, nobody has gone after the idea of private prisons in general. Um, and of course, you know, the really unsavory part of that is that those private, corpor the private corporate prisons are also having 
near slave wage labor uh, going on. And so it, you know, especially in the states where private prisons are rampant, you're seeing this huge influx of people being imprisoned. Uh, and especially, you know, it's something like 60% of them are African American at this point. And you know, I saw, saw some startling figure, like almost over half of um, African American men are felons at this point um, because of like the drug wars and other things like that. Um, and these corporations, you know, instead of going overseas, are now purchasing themselves a prison so they can use American slave labor and pay even less than they would if they went to China. So it's pretty outrageous. Is there a uh, legal definition for terrorism? No. Uh, there are actually over 400 different <laughs> definitions of the word terrorism in the U.S. laws alone. There is no such thing as a crime of terrorism. When people say you're going to be charged with terrorism, that's not true. There is not a single crime called terrorism uh, in the U.S. books. So how would that affect this, I think it's called the NDAA that just passed? Uh-huh. Um, it's, it's totally up for grabs then, right? Well, as with lots of laws, like the Patriot Act and the National Defense Authorization Act that he just mentioned, they're written so broad and so vague that they really could apply to even, you know, nonviolent civil disobedience. And of course our government, you know, persuades us that they would never interpret the law that way and it would never happen that way. Um, but in that case, in those laws, like the Patriot Act, they actually make their own definition of what they say is terrorism. Um, you know, for instance, in the Patriot Act, it says if you attempt to intimidate or coerce a government agency, intimidate or coerce, you know, coerce means, you know, kind of to convince. So that means if you go protest outside the Forest Service office to coerce them to change their policy on something, that could fall within the definition of terrorism. And of course the government says they would never apply it that way, but um, you know, I think if it ever happened, you'd have a pretty good legal challenge. But that, the, that type of law, you know, part of the reason they write them that way is so that they will chill people's lawful rights. You know, part of what they're trying to do is intimidate people from burying, you know, wanting them to bury their heads in the sand and not do anything out of fear that maybe they'll cross this imaginary line from legal to illegal. Especially, you know, with the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act, that was the full intention. Um, the law was so vague that a lot of people, you know, that I talked to were afraid to go to a circus protest or go to a boycott because they didn't want to be labeled a terrorist. And so this idea of chilling people's lawful rights and intimidating them into not exercising their rights is primary in a lot of these legislative actions that we're seeing right now. You know, I mean, that one I mentioned about Twitter, uh, making it a felony for Twitter, they were literally calling that the anti-Occupy bill. And that was an ALEC-sponsored bill. So ALEC is sitting around saying, what are we going to do about these Occupy bastards who are drawing attention to our good names? And so what are they going to do? They're going to try to take away the mass mode of communication that that movement is using successfully to mobilize. You know, make it a felony to use Twitter. I mean, it's, in, it's incredible, but, um, you know, it's why we really have to be vigilant at this point. I mean, I found out about that bill about a week ago. It had been on the floor for a full week before I even heard about it. And luckily, you know, it was killed by uh, the legislator in hearing, but that could have been passed and that could have been law and most of us in this room wouldn't have even known about it. Any other questions? Yeah, in the back. Will you repeat the name of that bill? Sure. It is S. Yeah, let me. I was trying to make sure I was going to get the number right. Yeah, um, yeah. SB fifteen thirty four. Electronic communications. Uh, I guess it's just called the Electronic Communications Bill, is the short title for it. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering if, if um, F29 was already kind of on the 
nationalized price scale of the that started you know, if that's like a global thing when you look at the spread or if that's already kind of being discussed nationally? We're going to talk more about that in just a second. <laughs> I believe it is a national day of action, but you're going to talk about that in a second. <laughs> where, did you, um, where did you get the information that they were calling it an anti-occupied occupied bill? Um, I think that it was Center for Media and Democracy. There's also a good article on Mother Jones on it, too, that I was looking at. Yeah. Are there any groups nationally or on the state levels who are actually pushing back and, and trying to actually really help going on with Alec and with specific legislators? Well, there are more groups than ever before that are focusing on Alec, um, like Alec Watch, um, ProPublica, um, Alec Exposed, right? Yeah, I mean, if you Google Alec, you'll see probably about 10 or 15. Um, People for the American Way is another group, uh, Alec Exposed, Common Cause. Um, there's a great report on our website, a big thickie here, um, called Corporate, Corporate America's Trojan Horse in the States, the untold story behind the American Legislative Exchange Council. It was put together by Defenders of Wildlife and NRDC. So it kind of has an environmental perspective, but um, goes into a lot of detail about Alec, and that's on our website too. So there's far more organizations on it than just a year ago, which is amazing and great. Um, in terms of pushback, I think other than really trying to expose them and do a lot of outreach and unveil the numbers and actually put the information together in a usable, sensible way, I'm not really familiar with any real direct campaigns other than organizing those protests at the national meetings. Um, that any particular group is really calling for at this point, but maybe you'll discuss that too. Yeah. Um, how you were just talking about uh, the laws being written vague uh -huh. around terrorism and the NDAA and all that. Um, couldn't it be? Is it isn't it fundamentally flawed when laws are written vague, like in law of physics? It's not vague. You know, there's much of laws of physics that are vague. There's no vagueness around the laws of Dharma. And the same thing that it's called vague, even in the Vedic perspective. Um, I mean, can't this be challenged? Can't all laws that are being written vaguely be challenged just at that point level? Well, there is a constitutional challenge for vagueness and overbreadth, which basically means if a person of normal reasonableness would not be able to tell whether their actions were legal or illegal. That's the test for vagueness. But it's been applied by the courts in such a strict manner that uh, whenever you challenge a law on its constitutionality, they, you know, it's nine out of ten you're going to lose. It's, you know, the courts are very reticent to undo what the legislatures have so thoughtfully put together. And because of the separation of powers, they don't like to step on each other's toes unless it's something overwhelmingly outrageous. And so it's really, really hard. Once a law is passed, it's really hard for us as lawyers to undo them. Um, really, the action needs to happen way before they ever actually get passed. Because well, how does the public know what's getting built? Built or constructed or whatever? Right. Well, um, I mean, there are websites, like the Oregon Legislature, for instance, if you go on the Oregon Legislature's website, every single day it lists all of these uh, bills that are being introduced and then there's a tracking thing. So if you have 20 hours a week to spend, you know, luckily there are generally an organization or two that spend their days tracking some of this stuff, but it's really hard to come by the detailed info. Like I said, I didn't even know about this bill till a week ago. Uh, and I run a civil liberties group, and I'm a lawyer. So uh, it's tough. It really is tough. I have one other uh, question. I, I, just because just you asked a couple, I think we only have time for like one or two more, so we should. OK, you're facilitating? Oh, OK, there you go. Are there? Yeah. Could you repeat your website, please? CLDC.org. Mm -hmm. okay. Easy. Civil Liberties Defense Center.org. Mm -hmm. Any other ones? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Can you begin what ALEC means? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the American Legislative yeah. Exchange Council.
It really means nothing. If those words really mean nothing. But they have to have a name, so. <laughs> so no other questions? Yeah. I just had a comment. I feel really bad for anyone that's uh, their parents named them Alec. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, well, so now I'm going to turn it over to Brian. And so tomorrow from 1 to 3 p.m. here, we're doing a Know Your Rights training for activists. So anybody that's going to participate in F29 or any other activist stuff and you haven't had a Know Your Rights training in a while, come. I'll update you if it's been a while. And we'll talk about um, that new case that we just won last week for cop watchers. Oh, and I have um, handouts here, our Alec handout. There's more over on the table. If you can't make it to the training tomorrow, help yourself to any of our Know Your Rights brochures or other information over there. Um, and I'll leave these here for folks that want to grab some there.